This is the last of the spring seminars of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion, and as I say each time I do this, I am Bob Pollack. I'm a biology professor and the director of the center, which has offices and operations at the Riverside Church, at Union Theological Seminary, at Columbia University, and in particular, in the Earth Institute of Columbia University. Um, we have today, for a speaker, Professor J. Cameron Carter from Duke, from, from, uh, Duke University Divinity School, who has the remarkable title that one would not find at Columbia, Associate Professor in Theology and Black Church Studies. And uh, we had J. Cameron Carter up here for a faculty seminar on slavery and memory, and my colleagues and I thought, well, we just have to have him back under conditions which are videotaped and which will allow us to have his talk up on the web of the Center for the Study of Science and Religion, where you will find all of our seminar talks. Um, Professor Carter has a book coming out called Race, a Theological Account, and I am assuming he will talk on aspects of science and religion as defined in, in our shared interest in the emergence of notions of humanity and notions of sacredness linked to the discovery of people who look different from the people who discovered them. That simple biological fact that humans appear diverse drives, I would say, a huge amount of theological difficulty in understanding what looks are most close to perfect and how we see each other in religious terms. It is probably the first time we've had a CSSR speaker who addresses these problems so clearly from a theological, Christological point of view, and it's a great honor to have Jay Cameron Carter here. Thank you. Thank you very, very much um, for having me here. Um, I express gratitude to um, Professor Pollock and to um, uh, Ocean uh, Foley. I don't know if he, there he is. We've been emailing back and forth and trying to get these matters straight for about a year or so now. I'm very grateful to you for everything that you've done and uh, taking care of such uh, important and quotidian things as making sure I have a place to stay overnight. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, I guess I'll just go ahead and jump right in and um, hopefully leave enough time at the end for conversation as well. Um, I left the title, I, I, this is going through a number of iterations for the title, I think the latest of which um, is Language and the Theological Roots of Scientific Classification, Jose de Acosta and the Production of Modernity's uh, Racial Imagination. I've tried to streamline that a little, um, but still keep the, the basic force of that title, and have uh, modified it basically to language, race, and the theological roots of scientific classification. The missionary vision of Jose de Acosta. Okay. I guess we can begin by asking just a, a simple question first, namely, who was Acosta? Um, quick answer, we'll get into this a little bit more but he was a missionary Jesuit of the last quarter of the 16th century. Why is he significant or important? Well, he's significant and important for me on several fronts. Um, let me outline three of them. First, what is significant to me is his pivotal role in abetting and aiding the process by which the discourse of race the invention and the sustaining of the figure, homo racialis, came into being. It's the first reason why he's important. We are now homo racialis, let's say the racial animal. We are this figure. We are the ones who now are understood as being bearers of racial character. Acosta's significance lay in the fact that he was a key player in the process by which homo racialis 
was invented, was born. And as we'll see as we go a little further along the line here, Acosta's pivotal role in midwifing the process, the coming to be of this figure, was not apart from the broader operations of coloniality and the subduing of the Americas. So that's the first reason he's important. But Acosta has another significance for me, and it's this. He displays the beginning gestures of scientific classification in this new racial way of imagining the human. In other words, Acosta functions, being a Renaissance intellectual, in the final moments, he dies in 1600, in the final moments before the split between the human sciences and, as it were, the hard sciences. And thus, to make his claims about the human, to establish lines of demarcation within the human, Acosta does not vacate the scientific, quite the contrary. He makes his claims on scientific grounds. And here, the key category is that of language. We see this most starkly in his all-important work, Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias, the Natural and Moral History of the Indies. And so Acosta's first point of significance is his pivotal role in that process by which the racial animal is born. This creature has a history, one of relatively recent vintage. And Acosta was no minor actor in his production. Acosta's second point of significance, I've said, is that the humanistic claims he advanced about the human, what he meant by moral history in this title, or what we would call culture, his claims about the human have a scientific basis, he believes. And thus he lodges those humanistic claims within a natural history, or perhaps better, within a history of nature itself. But there is a third significance to Acosta. He gives us a glimpse into Christian theology's key role in all of this. Indeed, a careful look into Acosta's thinking gives us a window onto what happened inside of Christian theology for it to give birth to and subsequently to sustain the reality of coloniality. It is this issue that I seek to carefully delineate. What kind of paradigm shift, play with a Cunian term, what kind of paradigm shift did Christian theology undergo? How did its theopolitical machinery begin to newly function to give rise to and then to sustain modernity coloniality? To consider Jose de Acosta is to consider not so much the initial moment of birth. That comes along in the 15th century and is tied to the events on Europe's Iberian Peninsula. To consider Acosta comes in the 16th century is to consider how the intellectuals of the 16th century, from scholars and jurisprudence, cameralists, broadly speaking, people working in political, what we might call political economy, and especially how theologians, how these intellectuals consolidated what happened in the enterprise of the Indies, the Spanish side, and what had come to pass in circumnavigating Africa and pressing into the far east of China and Japan, the Portuguese. Acosta is a key figure in reckoning with the production of the colonial difference, as one of my colleagues, Walter Mignolo, has called it. Wrote kind of small here. It's to reckon with coloniality as raciality, but also then as science. And it's to reckon with this just before the shift in, in, in the shift in imperial power from the Catholic European South 
to the mainly Protestant European North. So Acosta is right at that liminal point when colonial imperial power, when imperial power in the West is shifting from the Catholic European South to the Protestant European North. And so he, he's a very interesting figure because he displays features of what is going out in the European South and coming features of the European North. Yes. And with the, with, with the shift of imperial power from the European Catholic South to the Protestant European North, the humanistic sciences and the hard sciences will increasingly drift apart, will split from each other. And so again, Acosta is interesting because he's like one of these last figures that's trying to actually hold them together. Now, there is much that might be said about this latter point, about the split within the sciences themselves. Indeed, the modern university, arguably, is built upon this split, upon the crisis, shall we say, of the sciences. But further elaboration of this point must await another day. What's important, given my interests and given this topic, is that with the split within scientific inquiry, the theological roots of scientific classification and the ideology attending such classification came to be suppressed. That is to say, the split suppressed the theological. What, we, what we're seeing, in other words, is as we move from the Protestant, from the Catholic European South to the Protestant European North, there's a shift in the way in which scientific inquiry executes itself. And central to that shift is the suppression of the theological origins of it all. So you have to do more archaeological work to discover how the, so the theological machinations have carried themselves out in suppression. So to continue my thought, it suppressed this split, it suppressed the theological backdrop against which what we know as modern science was born. Now one might say that the solution to the problem if one takes the problem to be that theology got buried within scientific inquiry by way of suppression, if one takes this as the problem, then it might be said that the solution is um, to be engaged in the, in the task more rigorously that the Enlightenment took up, to wit, the task of critique. Here the task is to set all knowledge on sure foundations, which is to say, to purge it of ideology or perhaps beyond the Enlightenment, to enter onto a postmodern project of one sort or another under the acknowledgement that critique itself cannot prescind from the ideological. Now, while there may be merit in a modernist or postmodernist project of one sort or another, projects that have tended to exacerbate the split within Wissenschaft between the humanities and the sciences, to the detriment, mainly now we see, to the humanities, what I'm going after here can neither be accommodated by a strict modernist or even a strict postmodernist term. I'm interested in the form of theological practice that set this train in motion in the first place. What are its distinctions? What propels it? What is its inner architecture? For it is this inner architecture, even if suppressed, this inner architecture that lives on in repetition, even when the theological as such has been dethroned. The argument I've been developing in my research is that the racial imagination is this inner architecture, and that as such, the racial imagination must be seen, it must be understood, in, um, it must be understood as a particular kind of theological production. What Acosta adds to my research is the claim that modernity's scientific imagination does not develop apart from this. From Acosta, we can see how it develops, one might say, in concert with this. This point, I already begin to develop. 
unbeknownst to me that that was what I was doing in my forthcoming book, Race, a Theological Account, particularly in part one of that book, which bears the title, Diagnosing Race. The main figure I use to articulate the linkages between the production of homo racialis, philosophical and Christian theological, between homo racialis and philosophical and Christian theological discourse is the figure Immanuel Kant. I had to read Kant as a thinker of race and to show how his critical philosophy, for which he's most known, his political philosophy, and his aesthetic thought, how each of these are adumbrated within a racial vision at the ground of which is an aspiration toward a cosmopolitan social order that itself aspires toward the instantiation of reason as the sine qua non of universality. Reason names for Kant a social arrangement a way of positioning bodies in social space. Kant believes his claim about race, his claims about race are in keeping with the latest knowledge of the hard sciences, biology in particular, and for him most especially. I then show how for Kant that this vision of the social process called Alf Clarong, enlightenment, a process that aspires toward the self-realization of a reasonable, quote unquote, social order, is in fact not just a scientific vision, but as a scientific vision, it is a religious vision, one grounded in Christianity conceived as pure rational religion. But what is Christianity as the supreme religion within the boundaries of reason alone for Kant? if not a Christianity, which is to say a social order, stripped now of all things Jewish. And hence, the Kantian cosmopolitical order, the cosmopolitical vision of Kant, which is a racial vision in which whiteness is globalizing itself toward universality and therefore towards perfection, rests itself upon, as he says in the Conflict of the Faculties, his late work, it rests on the euthanasia des Judentum, the mercy killing of all things Jewish. And so the imperial containment of the Oriental Jew within the European border is the analogy to the colonial containment of the Oriental non-Jew outside the European order, a double border the imperial border within and the colonial border without constitutes the global reality of raciality, the global reality of whiteness. This double border marks out the boundaries of the human qua human, according to Kant. But what is central to the argument I advance is this. Kant, the critical thinker, proves to be Kant the racial thinker, and Kant, the racial thinker, proves to be Kant, the religious thinker, but not just any kind of religious thinker. He is the religious thinker whose aesthetic outlook on the world, whose gaze is constituted by means of a containment of the Jews, a people whom he clearly sees and calls, this is a racial term now, oriental. His religious gaze is an oriental gaze. It's a racial oriental gaze through which is enacted a racial imagining of bodies in social space and in thought. And of course, we know the two are not separated, though we might distinguish them. In broad, stro broad strokes, such as the reading I develop of Kant. But as I got to the end of the Kantian part of my research, in which I sought to develop rigorously a materialist reading of Kant, I was forced, I was forced to ask where Kant got this vision. Where did such theological, religious, and scientific, again, the two are still pretty close, where did these sensibilities come from? Indeed, how are they to be understood in relationship to the broader unfolding of the modern West? And finally, 
How did it come to pass that the supersessionist and anti-Jewish theological infrastructure out of which Kant functioned got so deeply buried within a scientific and moral outlook such that what is specifically theological about the modern world, its supersessionism against all things Jewish, as we now know and inhabit it, has become intellectually now hidden to us, though the effects of the theological contours of modernity are surely not hidden to us. Parenthetically, I have here one need only look to the plantation economy of, the new, of new world slavery in North America, to the Shoah in Europe, and to the tragedy of 9-11, all of which were modulations of the religious, the theological, and of the racial imaginary as a global imaginary. All we need to do is look at these to see the confirmation that the effects are not hidden. In answer to these questions, my present research turns to an earlier moment then in Western epistemology, the moment before the one Kant occupies. If Kant occupies the moment in which the theological functions surreptitiously, that is, under the cover of, and perhaps even as science, and that came to operate out of a northern predominantly Protestant Europe, then the prior moment functioned out of a southern predominantly Catholic early modern Renaissance Europe. In this earlier moment, the theological wasn't suppressed. And importantly, it functioned to bring to fruition, quote unquote, modernity as a colonial reality. The colonial is the underside of the modern, as Walter Mignolo has said, with a certain operation of the theological functioning as the midwife between the two. This earlier moment also cast the Jews as the border reality the internal difference within Europe in relationship to an external difference. But the external difference here is now two-sided. On the one hand, it functioned in relationship to an Orient that was oriented around the Mediterranean Sea and in relationship to Islam. Now, I don't have this here, I'll pause parenthetically and just um, refer to a scholar working here actually at Columbia. Um, um, I forget his first name, but um, Anijar who's written several, um, two very important books. One is called um, The Jew, the Arab, A History of the Enemy. And more recently, he's written um, a book entitled Semites, Race, Religion, and Literature, I believe is the subtitle. Um, particularly the first book on the history of the enemy, the two-sided dimension of the enemy as the Jew and the Arab, it powerfully outlines the point that I'm developing here, actually. And it's very, it was very encouraging to come across his book after I started to develop my thinking on this. Um, so to continue, the quest was the recapturing of Jerusalem in this early moment, and thus the bringing to ultimate conclusion the Crusades. But on the other hand, the external difference gets expanded beyond the Mediterranean Sea. This occurs when the Portuguese begin venturing into the Atlantic Ocean and into sub-Saharan Africa with the ventures of Prince Henry the Navigator, and especially when the Spanish commissioned an Italian mariner, Christopher Columbus, to venture west into the Atlantic for an expedited route to the Far East. The purpose of such an excursion seen from Columbus's vantage was to have forces in the East to assist in taking Jerusalem from the Muslims, the Saracens as they were called then, with forces in the West and forces in the East, there will be adequate resources, so it was believed, to take Jerusalem, quote unquote, for the cause of Christ, and so usher in, again, the end times. The early Oriental imagination was very much then an eschatological and an apocalyptic, and therefore a certain kind of theological imagination built upon Christian supersessionism. Such marks the advent of the modern world. It's coming to be in Renaissance infancy. Now, I don't want to go too much further into this here. The claim I seek to make is simply that the internal difference, the border within Europe as the border of the Jews' body with the emergence of the Atlantic commercial circuit also marks a border without or outside Europe too. In this respect, the Jews' body is the body that is to be the theological possession of the West, Jerusalem, and the body to be surveyed, 
to be policed and subjected to the gaze of surveillance and thus the body to be held at a distance for objective inspection. It is the body, it is the body in light of which all other bodies are to be classed, classified, placed within an ordo. Herein lay the significance of the 15th and 16th century blood purity laws, Limpienza de Sangre, that arose in Iberia. These laws set in motion a vision of the human as homo racialis, a vision of the human tied to what Michel Foucault in the history of sexuality called an analytics of blood. But beyond Foucault, we see that it precedes the 19th century, which was Foucault's claim. It antedates the 19th century. These blood, these blood laws were deployed against conversos. Jews had converted, who had converted to Christianity, and also deployed against Moriscos, ostensive Muslims who had converted. Basically, the blood law said it doesn't matter whether you were baptized into Christianity if you have ancestors that were Jewish. By virtue of continuity of blood, the comfort is really still Jewish. What is subtly occurring here is that Christianity itself is being rooted in the bloodlines of Europe. And on, the basis of, and on this basis, Jews, because they are of different blood, this is the subtle shift, not because we have disagreements theologically about who God is, but because we have different blood. So we're getting the movement towards what will develop into a kind of biological account. Because they are of different blood, they're being banished from Christianity. And suddenly now, Christianity as well is being read not in theological terms, but the theological is being refracted even with Christ within Christianity now through the biological. The theological difference from Judaism is establishing a racial difference from them. Indeed, it is establishing, we are witnessing what I'm trying to outline is the production of whiteness. One might say by converting Jews into a, re a racial religious object over and against Christians who in relationship to them are racial religious subject. The classifying of the Jewish body over against the normalized Western body is the basis of eventually making scientific claims, truth claims, quote unquote, about all other peoples in relationship to the West. The science of the human does specific work within this newly emerging configuration of the world. What is key here is that race is being constituted as a religious, a religio-scientific reality. It is emerging inside of a shift within a Christian theological imaginary. It's not that Christianity has ceased being supersessionist. They have a long history of that, that's not new. Rather, it's theological supersessionism through an analytics of blood begins to racialize and render itself now, to use our language, scientific. The surveying, policing, and aestheticizing of the Jew's body begins to function, as, function in such a way as to mark out, survey, police, and aestheticize bodies beyond or outside of Europe so as to locate such bodies within the social space of the Atlantic commercial circuit. So th this is the key moment. It's the rise of the colonial, the rise of what the Atlantic circuit signifies, right? That, in, that sends Christian supersessionism into a paradigm shift to give birth to what we will now begin to recognize as the scientific. But because this is taking place in relationship to theological supersessionism, we can say that the process of racialization in modernity is itself a certain kind of theological operation. This is what was going on in Kant, even as he was attempting to render the racial imagination scientific and so suppress its supersessionistic theological architecture. In looking at this earlier moment of the very emergence of modernity coloniality, one can see that racialization is Christian theological supersessionism rendered global and made coterminous with the unfolding, again, to quote Mignolo, my colleague, um, uh, unfolding of what he calls 
building on the work of Emmanuel um, Wallerstein and um, Arigi, um, what they all have called the modern colonial world system. Indeed, the former, insofar as it is a theological operation, gave rise to the latter. It represents the absorption of all peoples into the Christian order of things, which is built on the Jewish internal difference, beginning with the so-called New World and the Amerindians. This, I think, is sufficient backdrop now to take up the importance of the figure of Jose de Acosta. To ask it again, who is Jose de Acosta? And wherein lay his importance? Acosta, to go in a little bit more detail now, was a Spanish Jesuit who lived from 1514 to 1600. And thus, his life ends just a little over 100 years after Columbus's enterprise of the Indies and the incorporation of the Americas and its incorporation, the incorporation of the Americas and its incorporation into the Atlantic Circuit or the modern world system. While he focused his intellectual energies principally in theology, Acosta received a broad and varied education at the University of Alcala. He studied deeply in what we would today call the humanistic sciences, the humanities. Early on, he joined the Society of Jesus, the Jesuit order at the age of 12 in Salamanca, Spain. This is not without significance itself. For though Acosta carried out his formal studies at Alcala, he was nevertheless quite interested in the debates that were yet raging among the Dominican, the Thomist scholars, at the University of Salamanca over the problematic conquest of the Americas and the enslavement of the Amerindians. A central figure um, a central figure within of, uh, of these matters was the Thomas intellectual Francisco de Vitoria. And the most famous of these debates was the one carried on between Bartolome de las Casas and Juan Yenes de Sepulveda. Acosta harbored a deep interest early on in being placed as a missionary in the Indies. In due course, the Jesuits granted him placement there. He arrived in the Indies in the spring of 1571. He taught theology there in the Indies, in the Americas, at the Jesuit college and re, uh, at the Jesuit college there and remained there for 14 years. In light of his time, uh, in light of his time spent in the New World and the experiences he would acquire there, he eventually provided theories about the nature of the New World and would frame them in such a way as to give guidance to further, mission, to further missionary work to the Indies. And so what Acosta is doing is he's, um, he's basically entering into the scientific enterprise for Christian missionary purposes. While he is quite prolific, Acosta produced two principal works um, in which he crystallized his theories of evangelization the evolutionary development of human societies and the nature of the Americas. These two works are his De Pro Procuranda Indorum Salute and his Historia Natural y Moral de las Indias. Coming at the end of the long 16th century, these works have embedded within them the anthropology ethnography that had come to be the inner architecture of the border beyond Europe the Orient as the non-Jew, that was itself built on the border within Europe, the Orient as the Jew. So the Jew becomes both the Orient, um, the Jew becomes the, the hinge on which we talk about the Orient. With Acosta, we see the racial imagination consolidating itself as a comparative theological operation rendered through science at the site of the, Indi of the Indies, the West Indies, and on Amerindian bodies. The point of the operation was to gaze upon non-Christian and even semi-Christian peoples, to bring them under surveillance, and thus make them religious racial objects of inspection in order to bring into sharp relief the boundaries of the human as such. My claim is that this, pro this procedure is a moment within the first gesture of gazing upon the Jew, 
of bringing the Jew under surveillance as non-Christian, even when they made claims to being Christian, conversos, and thus citizens of Castile, Europe, and thus make them religious, um, racial religious objects of inspection so as to delimit, to delimit the boundaries of the human, quay European, which is to say, quay white, right? Indeed, all of this is precisely whiteness constituting itself. Key to how the gaze and thus surveillance functions to constitute the religious object in the costa is through language as the index of culture or civilization. And so, let's take a look at the first of these texts. To unfold this, I start with Acosta's 1571 De Procuranda, which set out to be a polemic in favor of evangelizing Amerindians and a manual to guide missionaries in being successful and how to in being successful in the Indies. For my purposes, it is particularly the first objective that is of interest. Acosta's interest in providing a polemic in favor of evangelizing the Amerindians. The polemic must be heard against the backdrop of the Valladolid debates, which pitted Bartolome de las Casas, a Salamancan theologian and missionary himself, against Sepulveda. Sepulveda basically argued that the Amerindians were Aristotle's natural slaves. They were thus less than human. Las Casas argued to the contrary. No, the Amerindians were indeed human. Anthony Pagden, in his quite important book, The Fall of Natural Man, shows that at the core of Las Casas' argument against Sepulveda was a claim about levels of civility, or put in negative terms, levels of barbarity. Las Casas develops his argument in his Argumentum Apologiae. He interprets the Aristotelian Thomistic scheme of human nature to suggest three different types of barbarity tied to three different levels of language. And so we're getting, beginning to see the early, mo the early motions of classification. Acosta's gonna pick this up and, and deepen it. Let's stay with Las Casas for a moment. The different levels of language mark out different levels of social, uh, different levels of the social order, and therefore different levels of civilization. Language is important because it was a clear expression of a people's culture. And the argument I'm really trying to develop here is this. The link between blood as that which is most interior about us and biologically identifies us, the, the, the biological tap root of identity, is starting to now work itself and marry itself to what we would call culture through language. Language is the hinge. Language, it was believed, was not unlike blood in this regard. It was the index of who a people really is. And already for Las Casas, arguing and writing before the middle of the 16th century and thus just before Acosta, there is the preference for the letter as tied to the ability to express what is thought in written language over against language as simply spoken. Spoken language points to the possible achievement of social cohesion as necessary to the survival of a community. But beyond the merely vernacular, literary language, letters, is a vehicle for the understanding of, uh, the understanding of power and the ability to control nature. Acosta picks up on this. He picks up um, um, the Las Casas and Salamancan theologians' arguments on language and pushes them further. Indeed, he will develop them into the theory of cultures or civilizations in relationship to European civilization. The general direction in which he goes is set out in the preface to De Procuranda, in which he distinguishes levels of civil civilization and in which he advocates for the Christianization of Amerindian cultures as a civilizing mission. But importantly, he sets out these objectives in relationship to, the provide, in relationship to providing an objective account of the nature of the Americas. 
This account, in, in other words, to, to sort of say it in a way that I don't have it here, he's trying to lodge his account of the, of the difference within the human species within an account of nature itself, a full-orbed account of nature. This account of the nature of the Americas is designed in effect, um, in effect to locate its nature within the teleological historical arc of nature itself. But what is this teleological and historical arc? It is the unfolding of the West. The unfolding of the West. So science is doing the work of trying to name the arc of the unfolding of the West and to lodge the rest of reality within that unfolding. And the West here, of course, is being conceived of as a Christian West, as Christendom, one might say, and thus the highest level of, of civilization. Acosta puts it this way in the preface. This is to quote him. Nevertheless, it appears to me after long and careful deliberation, for there are many provinces, regions, and many types of peoples, that the barbarians can all be reduced to three classifications or categories. The first class are those who do not depart greatly from true reason and the common way of life. They have a stable form of government, legal system, fortified cities, magistrates who are obeyed and well established, prosperous commerce, and what is most important, the use and knowledge of letters. For where there are books and engraved monuments, there the people are more human and civilized. Number one in this sort of class would be the Chinese, who have an orthography similar to that of Syriac, which I have seen. And it is said that literature, academies, public laws, and the courts flowered there, as well as magnificent buildings and public monuments. Then come the Japanese, and many other provinces of eastern India, which I have no doubt in times past um, received European, which, which have no doubt in times past have received European and Asian cultural influences. However, all these nations are really still barbarians and have strayed from the right use of reason. They have reason, but it's distorted reason, the right use of reason, for they are powerful and do not lack human wisdom. So they will have to be subdued, they will have to be vanquished by the gospel, but not violently, but through reason. Violently in terms of military arms. But there's the violence of reason itself going on here, of course we can see. In the second case, I include the barbarians who did not achieve the use of writing, nor the knowledge of philosophy or civil rights but nevertheless have their nationhood and government defined by leaders, and where they have fixed settlements and custodians of law and order, armed forces and captains, and finally, some form of solemn religious worship. Amongst this order are the Mexicans and the Peruvians, whose empires and republics, laws and institutions are truly worth, um, worth, um, worthy of administration. And with reference to orthography, they, su they supply their lack of it, so they don't have writing, with, um, with such ability and ingenuity that it was allowed them to remember their histories, their laws, their ways of life, and what, even more, what is even more interesting, the calculation of seasons, accounts, and numbers. And so parenthetically, I should say that what we get in um, Acosta's second document a natural and moral history of the Indies is his attempt to write the history that the second class of barbarians can only remember. And in that sense, execute a civilizing mission for them. Bring them to literacy. Give them word. Nevertheless, they fail to reach, um, they fail to reach true reason, this second class and the civilized way of life of the rest of humankind. This class of barbarians covers large areas of the New World because in the first place they form empires like the Incas and also they have our sort of, they have our sort of kingdoms and minor principalities 
because they practice such a monstrous number of rights, customs, and laws, and there is within the kingdom the tendency to stray um, from the flock, if they are not controlled by a higher authority, they will find it difficult to receive the light of the gospel and to take on customs that are worthy of humanity. And if they, don't receive, if they do receive the gospel without that sort of control, then one doubts if they will continue in it. And finally, he says, it is not easy to classify the third class of barbarians, for there are many groups and nations of them in the new world. Amongst them are the savages similar to wild animals who hardly have human feelings without law they are, without agreements, without government, without nationhood, who move from place to place. Or if they live in one place, they are more like wild animals' caves and animal, animal cages. Now in the new world, there is an infinite number of this last class. To end my uh, long quote here. What do we see in this? In this, we see Acosta's classifying scheme. Each group is graded according to how it exemplifies right reason. But right reason has here the material features of degrees of civilization, the degree to which the groups show a government and civilizational arrangement close to or far from the civil order among Europeans. But there is something else that must also be seen. The degree of civility or not, is tied as well and perhaps even centrally to the use of letters as the highest expression of language acquisition. Indeed, the social order is in fact a linguistic order and the sociolinguistic order indexes the nature of the barbarians. Acosta refines this, this basic scheme in the natural moral history of the Indies. The first part of that text seeks to make sense of the new world within the natural order of things, natural history of the Indies. And thus, the Americas was gazed upon so as to be lodged within a chain of being that, that included the flora and the fauna, the cougar and the parrot. He functions as a kind of Pliny, that is to say, Acosta functions as a kind of Pliny in the Americas. But within the second part of the book, this is where he develops the whole scientific apparatus, the first part of the book. Within the second part of the book, Acosta presses the moral interior of the scientific apparatus. He lodges the Amerindians within the moral order of things. Here again is where Acosta picks up ritual, uh, um, picks up ritual accounts and talks about language as the index of civilization. Language becomes even more clearly in this later text, a religious reality, a reality that marks out the teleology of civilization as semiotically inscribed now on bodies. Non-European bodies get civilizational inscription civilizationally inscribed into the Western body politic through linguistic technologies, particularly technologies of scripting, of scripture, one might say. The word of God is now seen to be a moral word, a moral word that maps out the order of civilizations. Here, Acosta also points to the sensibilities that will be refined eventually in Reformation Protestantism when the imperial shift happens from the south to the north. In other words, the, the move on language, inscription, text, textuality, word. You can see how Acosta, even though he's Catholic, but he's now at the moment when Protestantism has, is beginning to take off and imperial power is shifting to the north. He's already developing a key feature of what will happen when we go to the north the thinking through of science through textuality, through inscription, through mastery of the word. For mastering the word is to master a people. And so, more or less, that's as far as I've gotten here. I, I've been thinking about this more and more as I was going to plane and I just ran out of writing time. 
I can talk more if you like, but I think I've laid out enough here and we have plenty to talk about. And I can give you more if you want though, but thank you. I'm gonna ask you a question since I don't see any other hands. Sure. It's a, first let me thank you. I, I found this talk very disturbing and informative at the same time. If I understand what you're saying about the, the biological implications of the supersessionary events in the origins of Christianity, then there seem to be to be there seem to me to be two cases of a an embedded denial within the ideology you describe. The first is a denial of the biological context of the place and the moment of the supersession. Mm -hmm. Right? Jerusalem is, after all, the Orient. If any part of Europe can be seen as Oriental, mm -hmm. so ha what happened to the origins of Christianity that that initial Oriental fact is lost in, in the superstition by Christ. Yeah. And the second version of that question is, um, it seems to me backwards that one has a case of a body superseding a text and then the text being found to be the supersessionary event. That seems to me my reading of Christian supersessionism is the law, the, the scriptures, the rules of the temple are now superseded by a body and the events of a body. How did that fact get denied in the supersessionist story that you describe? Yeah. Are those reasonable questions? I'm I, not I think so. I'll try to answer them. Okay. Very, they strike me as reasonable. Um, and they, they strike me as actually tied together. Um, they, I think I see them as closely linked. Um, what happened to Christianity on the one hand with respect to Jerusalem, and I think what you're saying on the other hand with respect to um, the law, right? Um, and they're tied together. I think this, this precedes the narrative I'm telling. The narrative I'm telling is, um, the narrative I'm telling is the paradigm shift that emerged in light of the deeper the, 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 the anterior phenomenon, right, that goes back to deep Christian origins itself. And so I'm trying to track out how a problem that preceded the 15th century metastasized in the 15th century, right? And I'm concerned with the metastasization. You're asking about more about, I take it more about um, what antedated it. And so I think on, on that level, um, I think that what happened with Christianity, one way to come at it is this. Um, with, when the dominant peoples calling themselves Christians ceased to be predominantly Jews and Christians became increasingly non-Jews, Gentiles, one of the things that was lost was precisely the fact that Christianity needs to be understood inside of Judaism. That's what was lost. That's exactly what was lost. Um, early on, Christianity had to fight this tendency. When it had many Jews in its midst, when, when you think about the the text of the New Testament, you think about the book of Acts, there's no such thing as it were as a church as we would talk about this. They went to the synagogue. When church got understood, when Christianity got understood, apart from Judaism, apart from Yahweh's particular relationship with this people, when that link got severed, I think you begin to see the taproot of the problem. And it will undergo various shifts, right? It will rearticulate itself in various historical moments under various historical exigencies and in different ways. But I take it that the taproot of the problem is that Christianity ceased to understand itself as a Jewish reality. 
I would similarly argue for what happened with respect to law. Um, I take it very seriously when the gospel writers who are writing under a notion of Christianity, but nevertheless write and say, they put in Jesus' mouth, I didn't come to destroy the law. So here you have a Christian imagination that actually affirms the law, that's trying to live into the law. Part of what happens when Christianity begins to see itself apart from Judaism is it has to reread the law, right? As in some way inferior to a certain body, Jesus' body, that comes after it. This is the problem. The 15th century is the biologization and racialization of that problem. I wonder if I could head in a slightly different direction because I'm I'm a historian of the, the period that you've been discussing, though uh, I don't have your, your range and scope, obviously. Go lightly. Um, the well, OK. <laughs> I'd just like to say a little bit about the background to Acosta as, as I perceive it, and then, then to sort of invite your response. Mm -hmm. The discovery of the New World happened at a time when Europe had been for West, well, Europe, let's just take the Latin world, because Europe was mostly Latin after the, uh, the overwhelming of the East by, by the Ottoman Empire in the middle of the 15th century. Western Europe had suffered a degree of cultural isolation which had made it possible to conceive of world history as being the history of the Christian Latin West. And they did, they did do that, there's no doubt about that. It was a, a profoundly myopic culture. But it was also a, a culture that biblically believed that you could take statements that, for example, the whole people of the world came out of the ark after Noah, yes. and that the word of the apostles preaching had gone out literally to every people, mm -hmm. and interpret those as literal truths which the discovery of additional cultures did not invalidate, yes. could not invalidate. Could not invalidate. Exactly. So, when peoples are discovered who do not fit the pattern, mm -hmm. peoples who are not monotheistic, peoples who are not living in ordered societies, even by the level of the patriarchs, so to speak, mm -hmm. then the assumption is something's gone badly wrong. Mm -hmm. It's not a progressive model, it's a degenerative model that's applied. Right. And the early 16th, and the st kind of stuff that Tony Pagden is talking about is where in the early 16th century, it is a legitimate question to ask, first of all, are we going to find monsters? Right. Are we going to find people walking on two legs with no heads but their faces in the middle of their chests and that kind of stuff? So-called antipods. In, in, exactly. And uh, this sort of readiness to believe that there are non-human creatures in the world continues right through to the 18th century. Yes. Secondly, if you find people who are unquestionably human but appear to have quote unquote degenerated from the level of civilization and culture which by the terms of the Hebrew scriptures they ought to have, mm -hmm. then how have they degenerated? Are they demonically perverted in some way or other? Now both of those, both of those oppressive myths mm -hmm. were able to be used interchangeably or in combination by those who, for whatever reason, wanted to treat the peoples of the New World very badly. Yes. In the light of that, Acosta mm -hmm. is kind of interesting because actually, as you say, with all this scientific background, because his whole Jesuit culture was a heavily scientific movement, right. although very Thomist, very Aristotelian, what he's doing is saying, Let's stop agonizing about the ark. Let's stop agonizing about demons and monsters and actually just describe these people and differentiate them. Correct. And so Acosta, in the perception of historians of the 16th century, looks like a relatively, yes, I agree with you, he is, he is the beginnings of a scientific movement, but he is also, in terms of his readiness simply to describe what he sees, mm -hmm a less pejorative reader of his material than what has gone before. Most certainly. Okay. Yes, I, I, I fully agree. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, he, the, um, and because he's a less pejorative reader, it's striking when I read the material, he 
He's really coming to the defense. He's still fighting the people who agreed with Sepulveda. I mean, so and in that sense, he has this very, as, as the case may be in his moment, a very um, kind of welcoming, um, supportive, um, in, um, yes, certainly not demeaning reading of the, uh, of the Amerindians. I, I would agree completely with that. Um, yeah, I fully concur. Yeah. What would I see the response being? Um, in broad strokes, to sort of put a, a, a make a kind of thumbnail statement again about the problem, which you've heard me talk, um, hopefully not ad nauseum about. <laughs> um, but the thumbnail of the problem is in the 15th century, we witness a kind of ethnographic racial vision become the inner architecture of the Western imaginary through the mediation of theology. That, that's the problem, at least as I've laid it out here. And I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the ways in which what happened to theology. How did theology midwife this? That's what I'm going after. And I'm also going after what are the subtle ways in which theology continues to do this in its many of its contemporary um, intonations and the ways in which what got suppressed about what theology does reigns on in other humanistic disciplines. Those were like the sort of two things I'm concerned with. So now if that's the problem, what kind of solution, at least as a theologian, am, am I trying to suggest? At the end of the day, it comes back to the first question, which is to say, what would it mean, what are the ramifications of thinking, for Christians to think their identity inside of another people. And just think about this. The logics of race say you cannot do this. The logics of modern identity formation say this is not possible. But Christians want to say, this is how you have to think about this. This is certainly how we want to think about ourselves as Christian. What would it mean to do that? What would it mean to do that? That's what I'm going after. You see, if I could continue just on the point, just to put a fine, I, I want to sort of really put a fine point on this. One might put the problem this way. What, the Euro, what, would, what would come to be called Europe, I mean, because Europe is very much under production like now, right, in the 16th century, right? Um, what Europe, what Christian Europe could never imagine was that it had to look beyond itself to render it itself intelligible. That's what he could never imagine. We'd have to look beyond ourselves to render ourselves intelligible. Instead, the only thing Christian Europe could imagine at this moment, it seems to me, is that everybody must look to us in order to understand themselves. This is the problem. The theological task of the 21st century is to name this problem as precisely as we can. And in as much as there's Christian blood, there's, there, blood is dripping from Christianity's fingers for this, it is the Christian duty to reimagine the way forward. Thank you. Well, I will let this seminar stand as the answer to the question, why does a university need something like the CSSR? Thank you, Jay Kilmer and Carter. Thank you.